Okay, uh, my name is Scott Hucker, and um, my wife has a company called Great Lakes Staple Feeds, and this is the agenda I'm going to show tonight. And although I, I'm, I may talk fast because I have a lot of slides, uh, at the end of it, I will show you where, where we're going to post this presentation and some other training materials so that you can see these slides or the recording that Megan prepares. So this presentation is organized uh, essentially by the seasons because uh, growing food is very seasonal. Uh, so it'll, it'll align that way. Uh, a little bit about myself. In 1984 in high school, I had to choose between aerospace engineering or being a horticultural plant feeding type person. Um, guidance counselors suggested I be an engineer and then uh, play with the seeds later. So that's what we've done. So now I choose my vacation days based on the weather so that I can work in the garden fields to grow seeds for my wife. And I've, I work for General Motors. And as I've traveled all over the world, I've always admired how people grow food. Uh, these are uh, paddy rice fields in China that were built about 800 years ago. So imagine farming in, 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 in that garden. Um, at home here, we have uh, solar on our barn, an electric car, and we actually heat the area that we grow the transplants in using Bitcoin miners. So that's a topic, it's an odd combination of topics for people. I have two granddaughters. Uh, she can't reach the pedals on the four wheel tractor, but she can drive the two wheel tractor. This, um, and so by, by, uh, by comments in the chat, I'd like to know these, these questions. Uh, how many of you have gardens and, and could, could it be bigger than 25 by 25 foot? Anybody want to start typing there? Make it a little bigger. <clears throat> and while you're typing, I'm interested. Do you already make your own flour from from uh, wheat berries? Two acres, very good. Um, and do does anybody do do cook the wheat berries? Most people just think of wheat as something you grind, but you can cook it. Fifty by fifty, fifty to one hundred fifty. Full gardens, corn. Corn does take space, but doesn't make very good polenta. Eight by four, 20, 23 acres, okay. That's uh, more than I'd want to use my two wheel tractor on. One acre. Altogether, we have a little less than one acre under, under tillage split across three gardens. Amaranth, okay, very, very good. So I'm going to continue on. So by your presence, I figured you're curious and sounds like everybody's the right people. So the first question is what to plant in order of simplicity. The easy things are to grow flint corn, and I'll get into some recipes later, or barley wheat, sorghum for the seed, which you can eat, or millet for the seed and amaranth. Um, making flowers from wheat, buckwheat, millet, or sorghum, now you need a little bit of equipment to grind it. And syrup from sorghum, uh, now you need the equipment to squeeze the juice out and then boil it. But the boiling is actually easier than maple syrup. Okay, so these are the kinds of things when I say grains, these are the range of grains that we're talking about. And the season starts uh, here in the fall in the medieval calendars, the peasant life, which is what I say I'm you know, a medieval peasant because we do so much by hand. So. Why the fall? A lot of grains like rye have to be planted in the fall and many wheats uh, also must be planted in the fall. And wheat, the fall planted wheat tend to yield more than the spring planted and they're a little bit different. It also helps spread out the workload. If you can get some things planted in the fall, it's less to do in the spring, which was already quite too busy. We tend to plant our fall grain in the middle of September. Um, uh, sometimes I might even start as early say September 5th, but um, you don't want to start too soon because you don't want the little wheat plants to get too big before the before the winter comes. So there's the just right size. <clears throat> so you start your fall planted grains like any other garden plot. Um, I till with a tiller on a tractor or any other tiller. Um, and this is how most people think of planting grains. It comes from your image of uh, Paul Ingalls in Little House in the Prairie with these little furrows, um, like a pointer, and a pointer, yes, there we go. So you see the ground has been prepared to create those furrows 
in this old picture and more recent picture. And, and what happens then is the seeds, you fling the seeds in a beautiful way and they land and sprinkle. And the ones that happen to fall on the bottom of the furrows get covered up when you drag a harrow across. But this is very wasteful of seed because not all the seeds end up at the right depth. And then there's a lot of loose seed on the top, which of course the birds will enjoy. So this isn't how, this isn't how I'm going to show how we plant. Or you might be thinking the more modern methods of, of this kind of grain drill, which the person with 10 acres might need, um, or these push type systems for a little bit bigger. And I, I have used one of these ones, but I prefer to do it by hand and you'll see why. But you need a sense of well, how much space do you need. So, <clears throat> so for a one pound loaf of bread, um, I'm not going to read all these uh, factoids, but essentially at one pound loaf, you end up needing to plant a five foot by five foot plot. That ought to give you enough seed to make one, a one pound loaf. And it's essentially you're, you're, because you're planting the seeds one by one instead of flinging them on the ground, you can be very efficient with your seeds, putting each seed about six inches apart. I like to use nine inch rows because I can still walk down a path and not step on anything. And so as a result, you get, you get, and we're using heirloom older grains. So you get big, big plants that are strong and robust that don't need fertilizer or any chemicals. And, and as a result, they shade the weeds so you don't need herbicides and you get one loaf per five foot by five foot plot. So you don't need a lot of square foot to make a couple of loaves per year for uh, holiday events. And for reference, in the Victorian era, a family of six used to eat 55 pounds of bread a week. So, because that was the bulk of their calories. You know, people back then, they didn't have electric motors. Uh, they worked hard. So, the 55 pounds of bread a week, you're, you're looking at 3,000 pounds a week for that family, which roughly you could get from two acres if you tended it well. And then other dishes you might be interested in, uh, you can take Hollis barley or, or wheat, but in this case, barley, uh, and cook it like you would rice. So uh, one part grain, two parts water, simmered on the stove covered for 15 minutes or so. So if you wanted to have a side dish of barley for dinner, you need one two and a half by two and a half foot plot per side dish. So you could work on how many dishes you wanted to have per year, um, maybe multiply by two for a safety factor. and and, and plant in your garden. And you can see we're talking garden sizes that was that, like what people mentioned here in the chat um, in terms of typical garden sizes. Um, all right, so, oops, slide. so back to the plot size and the, and the equipment slash toys you might need. If you're in the 10 square foot garden, you know, that's gonna give you only a couple of dishes of barley, but you're definitely using hand tools and, you know, little, ho dogs and hose, even a hundred square foot, you know, 33 by 33, you're still talking hand hose and regular hose. When you get into the, um, I'm sorry, thousand feet, 33 by 33. Now you, you still could do everything by hand, but you might want a wheel hoe to speed up some of the work. Maybe another kind of wheel hoe to help with the weeding when you start to get into the 10,000 square feet gardens. We're in about the 40,000 square feet range. And so we have, we have a two wheel tractor that we use for tilling, but um, you know, you start to get in these bigger ones, you're starting to get into tractors like my grandpa had. He was a farmer, a couple hundred acres. Um, and, and that's not in the scope of this class. And also when you search on the internet, the yields modern farmers get with modern equipment and modern chemicals um, require all those inputs and require more precise timing. So be careful there. So my goal when I'm planting is to get that wheat seed a good solid inch of dirt below the surface. If it's too deep, it will be slow at germinating. And if it's too shallow, the plants might fall over as the ground settles and as the frost heaves in the winter. So I like to use, um, after I till, let the, let the fluffy soil settle for two days or so. Maybe rake it with the steel yard rake. Maybe rake it with a, with a seed bread prep rake, just because I like the soil to look really pretty like this. And then uh, to mark my lines, I, I have another wooden rake that I've removed some of the teeth so that there's a tooth every nine inches so that I can scratch lines in the ground instead of using string. And then this little kind of ho dog hand tool, we, we use those a lot. Um, 
So you can see the furrows are with nine inches apart. Each furrow is just nicely spaced so that you essentially are, don't bury the furrow next to it. So you can put several furrows in the ground, walk along, put your seeds one by one every six inches or so, or if you've got a lot of seeds and you're in a hurry, sprinkle them and thin them out later. Um, after I plant the seeds, uh, we use a rake like this and just rake across to fill the furrows back in and walk back and forth and hope the birds don't find it. Um, I do use strings to set up areas of rectangles and squares and whatnot so that I, and then wooden stakes, see those orange stakes. It's very important to label everything you do because um, gr most grains, you can't tell what they are from the seed. They all look pretty much the same. And it's very easy to accidentally plant the same thing, uh, two things into the same spot. I've done that once. Um, your furrows, depending on how pretty your soil is, we got a lot of clay, so we get kind of clumpy soil. So to get a nice clean furrow, sometimes you have to come back along with the hoe dog and, and uh, scoop out the clumps. I've tried eight inch spacing between my rows to try to squeeze in just a few more rows. Um, but then it becomes hard to walk between them without stepping on things. So in the end, I settled on nine inches. Here's, here's what my wheel hoe looks like. Um, this is the Earthway tool wheel hoe. Um, it's, I always leave this one set up with this little chisel scoop that creates these nice furrows. I usually have to do it twice. Once, once to get the line started and then back the other direction to make it clean. So I get a nice uniform depth. Um, when we were smaller, we just used ho hand, hand hose, regular hose. Um, when you start to get into the several thousand square feet, you, you need things like a wheel hoe to speed everything up. But so far you're noticing there's, there's really nothing gas or diesel powered other than the tilling. Everything else is, is we're just, you know, you can see the little plots here. Every one of those orange sticks is another kind of grain. Um, it's not really something you need a lot of expensive equipment for. <clears throat> All right, for rare seeds, you know, I'll drop, we'll drop those one by one so that the plant that grows, because grain has a pretty good germination rate, so I'm not too worried about that. And I want each plant, I don't want them to get spindly and fall over. So I'm looking for good, strong, healthy plants that yield lots of big fat seeds because we're a seed company. If you're going for pounds of grain per yield, modern farmers plant way more dense than this, and then they fertilize as well, and sometimes um, uh, water as well, we, we don't water. Or if you got, a, if it's something you've got a lot of seeds of, you know, I might walk along and sprinkle them in like, like amen for one, one seed every four inches. Just depends on what I'm planting, how much time I have. Uh, and there you can see all the little orange stakes, it's a giant patchwork quilt. Um, oh, that slide got repeated. Um, I, after I cover over the seeds with the wooden rake or the metal rake and walk along to pack them down, I normally will rake over everything to make it nice and smooth. I, my goal is maybe then the birds can't see the rows. I don't know, I try. So here's, here's what it looks like, you know, a field of this probably has in that view, maybe a dozen different kinds of grain. Um, and essentially in the fall, by the time I'm planting the last of the grains over here, the grains I planted at the beginning of the month are, are up. You can see the little, little sprouts in the, in the dirt. And now the weeding began. But luckily in the fall, soon everything slows down, the weeds die, the ground freezes. Now it's time for eating on the medieval calendar. Winter is for feasting and recipes in this case. So like I mentioned, um, all these grains we grow except for corn, we don't cook that corn that way, but the, the sorghum grains, the wheat, the barleys, um, the millets, you can cook them in this basic one part grain, two part water, simmer it, um, and then serve it as a side dish or serve it in a, in a squash like this. And then the uh, flint corn is another one we grow a lot of. And flint corn is uh, very uh, famous for polenta or make it a little thicker and fry it up. Um, Hush puppies, that kind of thing, or cornbread. And it doesn't take a lot of corn. It doesn't take a very large space to grow the corn you'd need for this. And it doesn't take much processing other than uh, you can use your blender to grind this corn into cornmeal. Or if you have a corn, if you have a mill, you can do that as well. But if you only have a blender, that's fine. We, we do that too. 
All right, moving through the winter, uh, winter in February is for sitting by the PC or sitting by the fire in the medieval times. That's where we talk about what we're gonna plant, who, who gets what gardens for which spaces. And, and because we grow seeds to save and sell, the, the most grains, um, almost all grains except for rye, they don't cross pollinate. So, so they don't, they, they're self pollinated. So as long as each plot of wheat doesn't touch another plot of wheat, they won't cross. So we end up with that quilt work pattern, planting a plot of wheat and a plot of barley, then a plot of wheat, a plot of barley, back and forth, never letting them touch each other. Where things like beans need about 20 feet and rye needs a mile. So we only grow one kind of rye per year and corn a mile or, or you can play some other games. Um, if you, so if anything you're growing for yourself, um, in, in our mind, you should save the seeds and not buy new seeds unless you have a reason can buy new seeds of something else. So that's the advantage of grains is they're, they're very easy to save seeds from. Um, in the spring, and this is spring I'm running a little late because it's already past March, um, it's to get the soil ready. And the key there is um, uh, not to work it when it's too wet, which is the problem right now. Uh, we don't practice no-till um, because of this. Uh, you can grow grains in a no-till fashion, big, Big farm, thousand acre farmers do that. They have some special equipment for that, <clears throat> which we don't have. But it, <clears throat> it is possible. Uh, so we do till. And as and as April progresses, and this picture is from the middle of April, so we're getting closer. You see, <clears throat> these are the wheat plants from last fall. Uh, wheat looks like crabgrass. Uh, many grains look like crabgrass. And so you see they're, they're, they're starting to wake up, they're turning green, um, the deer would like to come in here, the rabbits come in here, and as a time check, you know, your, when your rhubarb is starting to do this, the grains are starting to wake up. So that's a good state to be in. Still too wet to weed? Yeah, I see some weeds in there, but we'll get to them when we can. The key for planting though in the spring is don't, just to pay attention to the soil temperature. <coughs> so, Here's a case where you know, the soil can be 37 degrees Fahrenheit. You can start planting your spring grains. But if you planted your corn, it would rot. It wouldn't germinate. So don't plant too soon. You've got to pay attention to what you've got here. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we use this um, thermometer from the grocery store to measure the temperature about an inch and a half down. Sometimes when you plant your spring grain, it snows, but that's okay. <clears throat> Wheat and barley that I might plant, say April 10th, have, has been snowed on and uh, it'll, it'll be fine. You, know, you, you certainly could do that with corn or sorghum or millet, but again, the grains are like crabgrass. So the planting in the spring is just like in the fall, except uh, everything has to happen much faster because you just don't have enough time because there's always something else to do something else to plant. And so you see those little, little sprouts coming up. Here it looks like I planted two seeds. And then uh, this is, as you get larger, um, so, and you've got more to weed, this, there's two pictures of this wheel hoe. We saw this at a trade show once and it's like, oh, I, I liked it. Um, it's got cutter bars you see here in the, in the lower right. So as you're walking, these cutter bars are slicing the soil. So it, it's, if I go back, it's, it's really simple. You just have to walk through the line, through the field, keep your feet between the plants, keep your eye on this cutter bar, and keep an, another eye on the wheel and another eye where you're walking. Um, you do kill a few plants just to get the hang of it. But it's very, very efficient because you can walk up and down the rows and, and decimate the weeds pretty quick. So here's a little plot of you know grain um, spring grain popping up, looking for the sun. So at this point, you see every every seed produced a little plant. And here you definitely see one plant maybe every two inches. So, okay, I sprinkled them a little heavy, but I have a lot of that one. And you're going to see sometimes I'll, uh, as I'm weeding, I'll, I'll whack out the extras with the hand hoe um, because I don't want them to fall over. I want the plant to be strong. And, and that means you, you, you have to thin them. It's like carrots. You have to thin them. Now you see as they grow, each little single plant starts sending up all these tillers. 
uh, around it. So in every one of these, it's going to almost everyone will have a head of grain. So, so back here where you were thinning and killing them to create space, what you ended up doing is leaving behind the strongest, who then tiller tiller fabulously and make a very strong plant. So it all works out in the end. And here you can see little baby plants in the setting sun. And let's see, and a wider view of the same thing. Now, I'm going to show this same plot a couple times. And at this point, if, if you've seen, you can see there's some differences, but this is each of these orange stakes is a different kind of grain. So probably some oats down the middle and barley, wheat, barley, wheat, barley, wheat, that kind of thing. And you're going to see it gets quite pretty as the season goes on. But the last thing we do in the spring after the last frost <clears throat> is the corn, the buckwheat, the sunflower, the amaranth, the millet, and the sorghum. Now, there's, there's two kinds of buckwheat, tartary and Japanese. They're both the same name, but they're completely different plants. The, the tartary buckwheat is a little more forgiving with cold weather. So here in Michigan, that's the one we focus on so that we can plant it a little sooner than the Japanese millet, or sorghum, oh, buckwheat. Um, so as the summer goes on, you, you, the wheat plants look like this. Uh, it's easy to see the weeds. Um, you know, cut them with the hoe. You can see the tillering is progressing. Barley plants are a little bit, usually a little bit ahead of the wheat plants. So every one of those clumps was a single seed. And so that's the amazing thing about grains is one seed might produce many hundreds of seeds from the finished plant. So. It's no wonder the world's not buried in grain. Um, and as the summer goes, the other things like this is red leaf amaranth, which makes a little black seed. And amaranth is something um, when it's small, uh, there's a couple different kinds of it. Um, you can cook it as you thin it, because it's another plant, you've got to thin it or, or it doesn't compete very well. But all the thinnings can be eaten like spinach. And even as the summer progresses, when it's too hot for spinach, you still can pluck some leaves off your amaranth and cook them up like spinach. So we don't grow spinach, we grow amaranth. And then we grow sunflowers as well. And now you can see in uh, early July, or in early summer, say early July, late June, you've got heads forming on these barleys, which, you know, nice, beautiful looking plants, I think. Um, this is just an, uh, another kind of barley. And you can see this one is a little bit dense enough that there's some risk as the grain gets heavy that they'll fall over. So you gotta, you don't want to plant too thick. Meanwhile, the, the corn is growing, got beat up by the sprinkler. This is that same field I told you, I'll show you pictures a couple of times. So now you can see Here's one kind of barley and another kind of barley and the wheat is, is, is coming along. Here's those oats. The oats are to keep these barleys from touching those barleys and uh, everything's green. It's, a, it's the most beautiful time to be in the garden with the mosquitoes. Okay. Um, so one of the things that in July is now as things start to ripen, when do, when do you cut it? So the modern farmer, uh, he or she has to use a combine, which cuts the grain and threshes it with, with metal equipment. So they need the grain to be very hard and very dry so that the machine doesn't smash it, crush it. But in the medieval times, and us hand peasants, we can cut it just a little bit earlier. And that's what people did until the modern combine. Is they would cut it when, the, when it was still in the soft dough stage. Modern combines have to wait to the hard dough stage. So that's a little bit different. You know, so grain of 150 years ago and the same grain grown today in a big field, it's, it's ripened differently. Um, you can think about how that might affect your bread. And so I'm going to show you some pictures on that. So if you take the little seeds out of the head, here's one that's completely dry and hard. So if you crush that, it would shatter and make flour. If you smash these, they're still like they're like hard bread dough and then in the soft dough they're even kind of softer and then you know in the late milk stage they're 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 gooey you 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 wouldn't harvest them we harvest here with manual methods and so 
the key is essentially in this stage of hard dough, the birds haven't come yet. The birds will come when the kernel's ripe here with a modern combine. Luckily, we start, we start just before the birds come. So here's a field. So as we get close, every day I'm out there taking some of the grains out in my hand, squishing them and eating them. It's like, oh, you're, you're still too soft. You're still too soft. Oh, tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll start. So you can't really do it by how it looks. You have to take the grains out. So here's, so this kind of wheat, you see there's no arms. You just see the little, the little heads. And this one, you have the little heads and it has the, the hairs, the arms. We find the awns help keep the, the birds and the deer from uh, eating as much as they do from the other ones. And then this is how we harvest our, our grain with a hand sickle or a pocket knife. Because um, again, the, the field isn't that big. There's no way I'm gonna bring any equipment in. I've tried sawing it with a big hand sigh, just not enough plot. Um, it's much easier at this kind of multi-thousand square feet, just just use a hand sickle. That's what they do in other parts of the world. And I make little bundles like this. And here's some more uh, wheat that's almost ready. And a close up of what that grain looks like. That's a barley. I got lots of pictures. More wheat, different kinds. Um, and you can see what's happening is some grains are ready, like this barley is ready, and this, this wheat next to it, it still may need three more weeks. So. We start cutting and harvesting because we don't want everything to be ripe at the same time anyway, because I don't have a combine. I only have my sickle. So you make little bundles like this, and I'm going to show you shortly what we do with those. And meanwhile, the amaranth is looking nice. The quinoa is looking nice. Quinoa kind of looks like a weed. It's another one. We, we, we eat it as we thin it, uh, sauteed, so we can eat the seed. So, so with the, what we're doing with the bundles of grain, um, you, you can picture the Amish field with the shocks stacked down the field. You could do that if you had a lot of it, and they still do that in uh, Indiana and Amish country. But uh, because we are wanting to make sure we protect the seeds and we don't have that many different uh, of each kind of grain, we just, we label them, clearly label, everything has to have a label, and we hang them from the rafters in the barn, and we run a fan to circulate the air so that that soft dough, soft grain stage goes to the hard stage under our control away from the birds. And here's a picture of, you know, a dozen different kinds of grain uh, waiting their time. So you, you could do this anywhere where you could get some airflow. If you, if you don't have good natural airflow, you, you better run a fan or, or you might get mold. And for threshing, so to get the seeds out, you could, you, you know, pluck the heads off and rub them on a, on a mesh or just use gloves and rub them together. And now you have this, this mess of the, the, the seeds and the chaff, the traditional seeds and the chaff, or you could take, um, put the grain in a empty chicken food sack or a pillowcase and beat it with a rubber hose. Old rubber hoses work really well for this. Uh, to, to beat the grains loose, that's our mentor, John Shirk. And then the easiest way to separate the chaff from the seeds and seeds is, um, these plastic shoe boxes work the best in front of a house box fan. So just pour that mixture from this top box into the bottom box with the fan on. And what happens is you end up with mostly seeds in the first box, a few seeds and chaff in the second box, the rest of the chaff blows away. Uh, be careful, don't do this in the house. And uh, you repeat this process a couple of times and you'll end up with, with um, you know, almost pure grain. So unless you're going to plant an acre, uh, if you're just trying to grow grain for yourself, th this is all you need for, for cleaning it. I wouldn't buy anything else. We do have this threshing machine, which is the faster version of putting the grains in the pillow sack, pillowcase and beating them with a rubber hose. But it's pretty expensive. They're harder to find anymore. But it, it can make big, uh, quick work. But I wouldn't buy one of those unless you're into the acre size because of the cost of them. For turning the grain into something you could eat, <clears throat> you could crush, crush it in your mortar and pestle. Um, you won't get as nice a flour that way, but, but you could do it and you could sift it. Or you could, if you had a corn, these used to be controlled by the king because the king wanted you to use his, uh, 
his Miller, so he could take a cut. If you had one of these, you can buy them on Amazon. Or you could grind it with a hand-cranked mill. We have this one as well. Human power goes here. Or you could run, um, this is a mock mill attachment for a KitchenAid mixer. You could, could run it this way. So we do that too. Um, so that's a front hurry. If you grind the wheat berries, you're going to get whole, whole wheat flour. But it's actually going to be more whole wheat than the whole wheat you buy in a store. Because they do a little bit of sifting. So you could buy a screen to sift it and make your whole wheat flour a little more whiter and a little more like store-bought if you wanted to. We normally just eat it all. And next comes the, the, uh, the oats start to get harvested. And now you see there's less and less standing in the field because you know, all the early stuff's gone. Um, uh, more kinds of wheat. One trick about oats is you, these are almost a little bit too late. Mo most people end up they, they, they want to cut the oats at the, when the, everything looks like the wheat and the barley, but oats are very easily will fall out and fall on the ground. So you have to cut them when the stalks still have some green in like this. The same thing, hang them in the barn and they'll dry. So here's just a bunch of pictures of grain, different kinds of wheat. You know, there's hard red wheat. You know, I think there's five classes of wheat in the United States. There's hard red is traditionally good for bread. You know, in my mind, any wheat you grow yourself is is worthy of whatever you want to make out of it. So that's what, that's what we do. Soft wheat is traditionally for making cookies. And this, this wheat, these really long grains, this was traditionally the bread only used, only allowed to be if you were the king because it was supposedly so flavorful. Uh, I've, I've eaten the seeds. I haven't made any bread yet because it's, um, it's, a, it's not a real productive wheat. That must be why it was only for the king. Durham wheat is for making noodles. And barley comes in two kinds, the naked kind, which means there's no haul, which means you can eat it, or the hulled kind like this, which means it's better for animal feed or for sprouting and making in the malt and making beer. Uh, different kinds of barley for different jobs. Buckwheat, like I said, tartary on the left is, is a little bit smaller, but can be planted sooner. We also grow Japanese, uh, and we use those for making pancakes. Millet. Um, it's very common in Africa, uh, not as common here, but it grows. Another kind of millet, same name, completely different plant. Uh, this one grows very, very well. Birds love it because this is often what's in bird seed. So occasionally we have to cover the, cover the grain heads to make sure we get enough from the sparrows. Another kind of millet, again, a completely different plant, which means we can grow them without crossing. This one is very productive in, in Michigan, dragon claw. Kind of looks like a claw. And again, one of these things where one seed makes a plant that makes tillers, that makes a bunch of heads. So it's an incredible multiplication effect. And then sorghum, there's four kinds of sorghum, some that are specifically for making grain, some for animals, some for making brooms, and some for making syrup. Uh, we grow three of those kinds. Uh, we, our favorite one is one that was developed in the early 1900s in Wisconsin. Sorghum is normally thought of as a Tennessee, Kentucky kind of thing. So you can grow it in Michigan, but you're not going to, you're not going to, it's not going to be a commercial crop. You're not going to make a lot of money on it. Um, but you can make it for gifts, which is what we do. Skip to a couple of those. Sorghum kind of looks like corn. It's a different kind of plant, but it looks like corn. And, uh, you squeeze the juice and, uh, this is the traditional way that you would think of, of like a reenactment, a donkey or horse walks in a circle. Or you, I know somebody used a bucket, a uh, mop bucket. It's not very efficient, but it can be done. Or you can buy the, these juicers from Amazon made in China. Or here's a mill that's made in Montana. The sap looks like antifreeze, but it's not. And it boils down uh, 10 to one. So four times more uh, four times faster than maple syrup. Um, we'll skip through that. So we're, we're we are in the. This is my last slide. Okay. Pretty close. Okay, so um, you can grow all these different grains. So it's not just wheat. And you saw by the recipe, really you can grow quite small if you want to try it. It's not like you got to put in a half an acre just to do anything. You really don't need elaborate equipment. 
depending on the scale and depending on um, your budget. One advantage of grains is you don't need to can it, boil it, freeze it, or pickle it. So it's easy to store. Um, I do, we, we do rotate all the wheats and barleys, especially through the deep freeze for say five days or so to kill the, there's a grain weevil um, that we, it's, a, it's one of those bugs that depends on humans. It can't take the cold weather, but it, but it loves the grain that you grow. So we, we kill them by rotating all the seeds through the freezer for a week. And let's see, down here in the bottom, if you go to Google, and you won't be able to do this, but you can do this tonight. If you Google Great Lakes Staple Seeds Education, you'll find our website. And we have a page where we put all of our community outreach education presentations in. So you won't find this one until, until Google has a chance to crawl it. But you'll find one we did last month and ones we've done in past years, including some on, on solar, making sorghum syrup, and uh, some other seeds and threshing workshops. So with that, uh, I think, Megan, you could unmute everybody and see if anybody is willing to ask a question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was, that was so well done, Scott. Thank you. So you guys should be able to chime in now if you would like to um, ask a question. Just uh, do remember we are still recording. Um, and uh, if you don't want to unmute yourself, uh, feel free to put something into the chat box and we'll see that as well. So well, um, people I, can, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. I had a qu question for you. Um, we had ordered two varieties of upland rice from Shirk Seeds. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what is the distance between rice varieties as far as cross-pollination? Um, I, I can answer that one. Go ahead. Yes, please. So, so it's... it's about four feet. Thank you. Yep, yep. We we use it. Um, you know, uh, Scott said that we alternate between the barley and the the wheat. We we also use um, you know barley beans. We essentially create a, a patchwork. But rice is one that also uh, cross pollinates by touch. So we usually try to have at least four feet between varieties. Mm. And I don't, I don't have a rice picture. I'm surprised. Anyway, uh, can you still hear me? Because my audio thing said disconnected. Nope, I can hear you just fine. Okay, good. So rice is one of those ones where John, John, John is our mentor. He's how we ended up being a seed business because of a Facebook conversation from years ago. He starts all his in transplants about 21 days before he puts them out. We do that with some, but we also direct seed because um, there's only so many transplants. We don't have a greenhouse and he does. So we can only grow so many starts in the barn under light. So the, the only bad thing about, uh, you, get, you get a lot more grain per, per plant if you do transplants because you get a jump on the season. And the, the big risk with direct seeding is if you do it when the soil's too cool, the seeds are slow, so slow to germinate and they look so much like weed. They're, it's very hard to, to, to weed them until you see the pattern of the little plant. And so we've been getting quite a few questions in. Scott, do you want me to, to read them for you from the top? Okay, yeah, you read them, otherwise I'll miss one. Okay, no, no worries. So um, the, the first question was, can you grow grain in Detroit? Yes, yes. We, 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 we live in, the, in Ortonville, which is north end of Oakland County. But uh, the um, Keep, Growing, Keep Growing Detroit group grew uh, rice a couple years ago. Yeah, I, I live in Detroit and um, I've definitely seen grain growing. I've seen rice. 
um, I'm sure we can grow everything here that, that you guys can grow up there as well. Yep. Yep. Good question. Um, you can also, okay. You can also grow I, peanuts. We, we grow peanuts here in Michigan. You don't normally think of the North for that. And, and down in the city, you have a little more heat, so you, you, you'd even do better. Good point. Okay, I know that corn can get inbreeding depression. Does this happen with grains too? Uh, not really. Um, I mean, you wouldn't want to plant just a few plants. Normally when I plant, say, a plot of something that's, say, four foot by four foot, when I'm selecting the heads, I'll look through all those grain stalks and I will choose the best 10%, the healthiest looking ones, the ones that say, pick me, pick me. I save those for the next year's seeds. And then I usually will toss in a handful of seeds from everybody else, give everybody a chance. But um, it's uh, grain is not like corn. Corn, if you're going to save seeds from corn, you really should have several hundred plants where you will eventually run into a problem last year okay, I grew, question. yeah last year i grew winter rye as a cover crop and harvested it but then got nervous about ergot i teach history have you ever seen this problem i've seen ergot and um usually if you make sure when you harvest it and um that you get that you dry it really well so you know don't pile it deep like like when i cut the stalks and we hang them you only can make a bundle you know really no bigger than four or five inches in diameter or they just don't dry as well so we make all those bundles and hang them and usually don't have any ergot problems but every now and then you'll when you're th threshing the seed you'll find the little ergot fungus looking piece and I always pick those out if I if I see them I'll stop and pick them out but um yeah I'm I'm familiar with some of the historical events that have happened when people have eaten ergot uh, causes you to lose your mind and, and somebody else said that you can check it with a black light flashlight that it glows red under a black light oh I've never tried that I didn't know that it's interesting all right, next question. There's a wide selection of small harvesting equipment available in Asia, combines as small as riding mowers. Anyone know of a place in the US making such equipment? I do not. Um, I like to look at the uh, binder reapers from India, but uh, no, I don't know of anybody. And most of that equipment, you can find it on Alibaba and um, if it's got a gas, gas or diesel motor on it, the biggest problem is, uh, is if, it, if the motor doesn't meet the U.S. requirements, you're going to have a customs problem. So you can, there are some Facebook groups that specialize in uh, 1950s, 1960s, L's, like especially Els Chalmers all crop units that um, you pull behind a tractor or pull behind a mule to harvest. Uh, I don't have one, but I, I look at them regularly. It's back to, I think you would need a couple of acres before you really would need such a toy tool. Okay. And so somebody else asked about um, which corn you said was the best for polenta and a couple of people answered the flint corn. The flint corn in particular, the Floriana red flint was yeah. selected in a valley in Northern Italy. That's the most famous one. And, and that's the one we like the best that it's, the seeds are very pointy and it's very hard. And uh, you get this really pretty red flaky look. Does anybody else have a question? Feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. And while we wait, I, I, do, I do want to stress that, um, that you guys sell, you are a seed company. And so for people oh, yeah. who are yeah. inspired to get started after this presentation, I definitely recommend buying your seeds through Scott and Eleanor's company. And you put the link to your website. It's just greatlakesstapleseeds.com, yeah. right? Yep. I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was actually, I found your website yesterday. I was researching uh, growing wheat. And then I saw that you're having this talk, which was great. Thank you for that. Um, 
my question is, I was looking at your site and there's just so much. Um, I live in Northern <laughs> okay. Indiana <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking okay. for like maybe a wheat and a barley to start off with. Do you have any breeds that you recommend? And also, well, I noticed, everything like, we, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, everything we grow here in Michigan will grow for you. You, okay. you, you have a slightly longer season than us. Um, and uh, John Shirk, uh, many of our original seeds that we started with came from John Shirk in, in uh, Goshen, Bristol, Bristol. Okay, yeah, I, I came across him as well. Yep. Okay, he, and then I, I also noticed like there's quite a bit out of stock. Is there a better, like, is it better to purchase a seed like towards fall or? Well, we, because we're small and only two people, um, officially only one, I'm unpaid. Um, we, we primarily drive the inventory because it's, we only sell what we grow. So um, we're really cautious about not accidentally sh showing more inventory than we can fill. And so the bulk of the spring grains get bought in the February timeframe, February and March. So we're all, normally we close on tax day and don't reopen until it's time to plant the fall grains in the, the end of August. Okay. So you're seeing, you're seeing, the other thing is, is we, and we're torn about this, we, we like, like here, um, sometimes we, we don't grow everything every year. And so for out of it, we leave the page up because of the information that we've, you know, that we've documented in the information. So that if you bought the seeds last year, we, even if we didn't have this in stock, we want people to be able to see the words and, and for Google to find us. So. All right. The best if you're really looking for something special, you can always send an email, and Eleanor answers those right away. Um, and then for grain, well, for wheats and barley's, you know, it's um, the the time is coming. So, but you got to make sure on on your on the, that you choose. Um, like if you go to wheat, I'm showing my screen. You you'd want to choose spring wheat. If you looked at some of these other ones you might be tempted to something that should be planted in September. Okay. And some, some fall grains can be planted in the spring and they'll be okay. If we know that we mention it, it's called facultive, but some fall grains, if you plant them in the spring, they just make grass and then they die. They, they, they never make seed because you didn't do what they wanted. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, and Scott, he, he asked about barley. So with the thing with the, with the yep. barley, try, pick one that, that is done so you don't have to worry about dehulling it because dehulling oh, barley okay. is, kind of, is still a of, challenge. Okay, see in, see in the picture in the barley section here, um, hauled. So hauled barley is good if you want to make, if you want to learn to malt it and make beer or feed the animals. But it's very difficult to remove that yeah. that hull or shell. You you can't do that at home. You need industrial equipment. So if you're going to eat the barley as a side dish, you need to choose the 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 hull as barley. Scott, There's we're still no... seeing your uh, PowerPoint presentation. Did you want to switch your screen to show us your oh. website? That's okay. Yeah. If you go down okay. to the share screen, and if you um, hover over the little yeah, you should be able to to switch to the screen yeah, with the website. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure people would like to see that to know where to go. Yeah, I, I've been navigating all around, but you that's okay. It, so. There we go. Okay, so, so yeah, so so the, our website, everything is driven by this menu on the left here. So, um, so the example of the barley. If we open up grains and cereals, um, in the in the barley, if you want barley with no hulls, you need to click on the hull, a hullless one. See, these barleys are all naked, so you can eat them directly. Ooh, I see one that's not. Um, if you want, if you were going to make beer or animal feed, you would grow these. These have a hull, and you can see in the picture, that little shell, you, you, need, a, you need a factory to remove that. So, um, if somebody wants to invent something that the homegrown grain people would really love to have, one would be a machine that could remove the hulls from barley, a machine that could remove the hull from buckwheat and oats. 
any one of those would make people happy. <laughs> it's, it's my plan for in retirement. Let's see. So the other thing I was showing in the navigation here is 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 if there's something hmm, uh, you know, something that's on a stock, um, and, you know, it shows unavailable, but but we still wanted people to have access to the descriptions. So even though this one's unavailable, we we left it here so that Google can find it and so that you can find the information in case you bought these last year. Now you. You want to see well what is what did we write about or what recipes did we recommend? Like here's peanuts. I mentioned peanuts. Not really a grain, but we grow them. We grow all these different kinds, and you, and peanuts are one of those things that sells out really fast. Do you see everything unavailable? Um, that's because they all got bought a month ago. Um, the only thing we don't well, we also grow squash. And beans and cowpeas and all those those grains as well. Um, we don't sell potatoes or anything like a root because uh, you need a special license for that. And then um, here, are all these other uh, educational materials are are in these menus here. So, any other questions? See if the chat has anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eleanor's been been answering a lot in the chat while oh, you've been talking. Okay. Um, uh, there was a response about um, finding um, a small equipment manufacturer. Um, said there is one in West Michigan for produce farmers, but they don't know the name um, hmm. or what what they can make. Um, and then somebody asked, "What do you use to stroke your grain? What is your favorite method?" And there uh, were quite a few responses that came into that. Okay. Um, somebody else wanted to know if you guys are part of any particular Facebook groups. Um, there's some homesteading groups for Michigan and small, there's a small scale grain group. Are you guys yep, part yep. of that? Yep. We're part of small scale grain part of, there's an upland rice group and there's a Northern corn group, um, which some of, some of our corn we specialize in to like, those in Indiana have a lot of issue with crossing with the farmer's corn, but luckily where we live, there are not very many um, corn fields. So we, we are shielded from that. But our season here in the North Oakland County is a little bit short. So we, we do specialize in, in the corns that, that grow really quickly. Um, for example, there's a corn called um, gas. It's, it's only about three foot tall. Uh, Oh, where's my corn? There they are. Corn. Yeah, makes these little bitty ears about the size of your thumb. It's good for polenta as well. And and it's 70 days. So we we can grow corns that are 120, 130. And after that, it's a big risk whether whether would the frost could get it or not. So this one. We, we planted several times in succession um, I have staggered plots, but yeah, it's, it's a little cute one. If you didn't have a lot of space, um, you know, three foot tall, it's only disadvantage is that the ears are really close, close to the ground. So in a wet year, like last year, we had a lot of problems with smut. We, we lost a lot of corn to, to, the, to the weather. Uh, any other questions? Well, we don't we don't currently grow any perennial grains. Um, I've I've looked at them. Are are they don't? My understanding is they don't yield as much for the plant uh, compared to the traditional grains, and they would require it would make it very difficult in the spring for tilling because we I mean uh, you we you have to be really careful not to. Where do you want them to be so they're not in the way of the tractor? Get the tractor turned around. Um, yep, there are some there are some electrical devices that can polish um, grain. Uh, John John Shirk has one for polishing rice um, in that couple hundred dollar range. Um, nothing hand crank that I've come across. Um, 
lemony tea cake. Yep, that was good. Uh, corn smut. Um, it's on my things to eat. Uh, uh, we lived in China for eight years, so I've eaten everything. But uh, to be honest, I don't think we've ever eaten the corn smut yet. We eat the puffball mushrooms. Let's see. Any other questions? Uh, greenish uh, oats. Yep. Um, do something to avoid. No, normally um, when we bundle the grain, like I showed the little bundles and we hang them from the barn, I usually tie the string in a uh, clove hitch and hang it from the rafters. We don't, we don't put any bags underneath. Um, as long as you're not uh, bumping them aggressively, I, I don't find that the wheat, the barley and the oats fall off. The amaranth is a little bit more sensitive and the buckwheat, touch it, these will jump off. So you do have to be careful. Uh, luckily, I can hang them high enough that we don't hit them with our head. Uh, use a coffee grinder. Uh, we've never used our coffee grinder, but we did. Um, we did use the blender just to prove that it worked. But we normally grind in. in, in normally, we use the mock mill attachment on the kitchen made with electric, um, and set and set the corn for, for polenta. I like the corn pretty pretty coarse. Or we'll use the hand cranked um, grain maker mill with steel burrs. What do you use to stroke your grain? Stroke. Um, it's, I'm not familiar with that word. If it means to get the grain off, to get the seeds out of the heads, normally for the small lots, I just use my hands and I, and I rub them together. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I meant store. It was just a typo. Store. Oh, <laughs> oh very good. Store. <laughs> nor, yeah. we, we, we've tried a lot of things, and for the seeds we sell, what's worked the best is washed down empty kombucha bottles. Hmm. Uh, in fact, Aldi sells one brand that the labels peel off clean. Mo most of them, the labels won't come off uh, without a huge amount of work, but there's one brand. You can get your fingernail under it. You can peel it right off. And now you've got a, a beautiful clear glass jar that the bugs can't get into and keeps it dry. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yep. John Shirk, he uses um, freezer cartons like you would use for like freezing corn. Uh, and he puts all those cartons inside of another bin inside of a room that he has an air conditioner to keep it cool and low humidity. But we... We use, we, if it's a small, it's a, if it's a variety we don't have a lot of, we use the kombucha bottles and then we work our way up to half gallon glass jars. All right, I'm not seeing any questions we missed. Nothing falls, yeah. experimenting perennial grain polishers. Yeah. Uh, will amaranth take over the yard? Uh, it won't take over the yard, but if you plant it, uh, it will self-seed itself the following year. But it's usually the red leaf one is very red and the um, hot biscuit that we grow is kind of a yellowish green. So it's, it's very easy to recognize. So sometimes those self-sowed ones, I'll leave a few of them because they tend to be a really strong plant, uh, but they're really easy to kill. I mean, I wouldn't say amaranth is is going to take over your garden because it's so easy to, to kill it as a weed. I'll leave for the win. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, you do, as a seed grower, uh, pigweed looks like amaranth and it can cross with it. So we're, we try really hard to keep, to keep the pigweed weeded out. And we also eat that too before we had uh, amaranth. Okay. Again, if anybody has any questions, they can uh, email us at, at uh, uh, I'm at Scott underscore Hucker at Yahoo, or if you go in through our website, Eleanor will get the email. And we'll we'll get it. Get you an answer. Yes, that was such a fantastic presentation. Thank you both for 
sharing all of your knowledge and experience. Um, and I feel inspired to Tear see up what the happens. Art. Yeah. Well, I already do that. So, but um, I, I, I would love to see what I can do here in Detroit where I live. I think some of these plots of barley would actually um, pass a homeowners association front yard test. You know, these, this, this kind of thing is so, so attractive. Absolutely. Well, if we don't have any other questions or comments, um, I guess we can go ahead and wrap it up for this evening. Again, thank you okay. so much, Scott. And thank you, Eleanor. Um, and thank you everyone else for attending. And um, I hope that you will continue to check out programs we offer at the Royal Oak Public Library. Um, I actually manage a seed library we have, um, and hopefully in the future, I'll try to get some seeds from you guys. Um, and feel free to stop by any time to check out our seed library um, and look on our website for, for other programs. And again, thank you all, and I hope you all have a very nice night. Thanks a lot, and good night.